a warm welcome to all of you who have joined us today for this important uh, webinar uh, under the theme Adaptive Leadership, Why It Matters in Times of Uncertainty. My name is Luca Kual. I am the Dean of Academic Affairs at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead of this program on emerging security sector leaders in Africa. I would like to begin, begin this program or this webinar by, by, by asking Ms. Kate Knopf, the director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, just for a few opening remarks and to introduce our outstanding uh, keynote speaker today, His Excellency President Abu Sangyo, and to introduce as well the moderator of the webinar, Mrs. Michelle Indaya. Uh, please, Kate, you are most welcome. Well, thank you, Dr. Luca, uh, distinguished alumni, friends, and colleagues of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, welcome to our program today with His Excellency Oloshogun Ogasanjo, former president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. We will. Uh, uh, we are indeed honored, uh, in fact, uh, to have President uh, uh, Obasanjo share with us today a keynote address uh, on leadership during times of great uncertainty, uh, and uh, to be followed by a moderated conversation with Ms. Michelle Njai, African Union Special Representative to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And then today's program will conclude with a period of open question and answers uh, with the audience. The entire program is being recorded uh, and will uh, be posted on the Africa Center website afterwards. And this session uh, marks the opening of the Africa Center's 2021 Emerging Security <laughs> Sector Leaders Seminar, uh, which is being held this year for all of our past alumni of these programs uh, in recent years. Uh, in recognition of the special opportunity we have to hear today uh, from one of the continent's foremost leaders we have opened this session uh, up to the entire Africa Center alumni community. We are therefore delighted to have over 300 alumni, friends, and colleagues from more than 50 countries registered to join us for this program. Thank you all for being with us today and all protocols observed. Given the size of our audience, we encourage you to submit your questions for President Obasanjo at any time via the chat line. Uh, and during the question and answer portion uh, of our session, uh, you will be able to use the raise hand function in the Zoom menu. Uh, when you are called on, your audio will be enabled by our technicians so that you may ask your question directly. Uh, due to the size of the audience, however, uh, participants' video will not be enabled. Before I introduce our special guests and we begin our program, I would like to say just a brief word about the Africa Center for those in the audience who may be new to us. The Africa Center for Strategic Studies serves as a forum for research, academic programs and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a US Department of Defense Academic Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. We carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue building enduring partnerships and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. This kind of dialogue infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis, we hope provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. So we're especially delighted to have His Excellency President Obasanjo with us today to share his wisdom on being a leader during times of great uncertainty and change be it from extraordinary shocks such as we are all experiencing now uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, or such as those he has guided his own country of Nigeria through in the past, as well as helped the continent to navigate. We're especially keen to examine what it means for a leader to adapt in volatile and uncertain security environments or times of crisis, 
and how these times can be used proactively you know, to enable fundamental, even institutional changes that would otherwise be difficult to arrive at. To assist with unpacking these themes, we have asked our dear friend and colleague of the Africa Center, Ms. Michelle Njai, to moderate a conversation with President Abbas and Joe following his remarks. Ms. Njai currently serves as the Special Representative and Head of the African Union Office in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Prior to this, she was the Director of the Africa Peace and Security Program in collaboration with the African Union Commission at the Institute for Peace and Security Studies in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And amongst many other roles you'll find in her bio on our website, she was also the founding head of the Tana Forum Secretariat, an annual high level gathering of African decision makers on peace and security in Africa. And President of Austin Joe was the founding and longtime chairperson of the board of the Tana Forum. Which brings me to our very special guest. His Excellency Olashogun Abbasanjo served as President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria from 1999 to 2007. He served as Head of the Federal Military Government of Nigeria and Commander-in-Chief of the Nigerian Armed Forces from 1976 to 79, when he presided over the voluntary transition to civilian democratic rule. And since 2008, he has since overseen uh, democratic elections on behalf of the African Union and ECOWAS. President Abbasanjo is indeed one of the most distinguished elder statesmen of Africa. He brings with him a long-standing commitment to peace on the African continent and an intimate knowledge of African politics. He has been involved in a number of international mediation efforts, particularly in Namibia, Angola, South Africa, Mozambique, and Burundi. And President Abbas and Joe has consistently supported the deepening and widening of regional cooperation through the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, and the Crow Prosperity Alliance Zone, incorporating Benin, Ghana, Nigeria, and Togo. In 2008, the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon appointed him as his special envoy to the Great Lakes region, where he played an integral part in mediation efforts in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. He has previously served as chairman of the Group of 77, chairman of the Commonwealth Heads of Government Meeting, and chairman of the NEPHED Heads of State and Government Implementation Committee. In 2014, he was appointed the chair of the African Union's first ever Commission of Inquiry to investigate the human rights violations and other abuses committed during the armed conflict in South Sudan. And I know he remains actively engaged in many efforts behind the scenes to ensure accountability reconciliation and healing in ongoing situations of armed conflict on the continent today. President Abbas and Joe, Excellency, we are so delighted to have you with us. It is indeed an honor. Over to you, sir. Uh, let me uh, thank uh, Luca Cole, uh, who uh, started us off uh, as the uh, dean of the um, 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 of the center. Um, let, let me thank you as the director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies for inviting me to be the keynote speaker for the opening of the Emerging Studies Sector Leader Seminar. And I thank you for the uh, uh, remarks that you have made and all the good things that you have said about me. I accept the invitation on the condition that I will not only be a keynote speaker, but also a key learner. Indeed, there's so much to learn from this distinguished group of mid to senior level African security officials drawn from across Africa. I urge you all to make this as interactive as possible so that we can all learn from one another. I will therefore make a brief opening remark just to, ta to start off the interaction. After this, 
I will take your questions and ask you my, if I have any. The focus of today's session is on the characteristics of adaptive leadership. In these times of uncertainty, and I am requested to share my reflections as someone who was president of a very complex country, Nigeria, at times of uncertainty. And of course, adaptive leadership entails making changes and changing so that uh, things can thrive and you too can thrive with things. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we are all familiar with the uncertainty that COVID-19 pandemic has created globally. Across the world, millions of lives have been lost. Economic activities have been disrupted and poverty has increased. Social activities remain disrupted. Indeed, COVID-19 has changed the world as we knew it to a large extent. This pandemic, along with its chaotic disruption of human activity, is unprecedented for many people in more advanced countries of the world. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called it the world's global crisis since World War II. But for us in Africa, it is not just COVID-19 that has sent shocks across our continent and threatened our very existence in the last few decades. Before COVID-19, there was Ebola, which killed over 11,000 people and left over 30,000 children of hand in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone within weeks. And before Ebola, there were many other widespread health and non-health challenges that plagued our continent. For decades, Africans have battled with disease, hunger, poverty, wars, violent conflicts, terrorism, and more recently, organized crime. All of these challenges across Africa require leadership to resolve them. Yet, in our case in Africa, it seems most of the challenges are being caused rather than solved by the leadership. Even as a leader in Africa, I am concerned about the state of leadership across our continent over decades. And I am not talking about just presidents and political leaders and leaders or leaders in just one sector. I am talking about leaders across various levels and across various sectors. I'm talking about leaders in the public and private sector, from local government leaders to presidents, from team leaders to CEOs, political leaders, military leaders, religious leaders, business leaders, all have too often failed to live up to expectations. Yes, there have been one or two or even three shining stars in one or two countries, but their efforts are not enough to make a critical mass that could make significant difference for Africa. What we need is critical mass of, people, of good and effective leaders across our continent. 
This is why I'm delighted that the Africa Center for Strategic Studies has designed this seminar and its programs to broadly cover our continent. This initiative and others like it should, um, should be encouraged and be supported. Ladies and gentlemen, as I earlier mentioned, our challenges in Africa are numerous, but for the purpose of this seminar, I will keep the conversation within the challenge of insecurity on our continent vis-a-vis -vis the shocks of COVID-19 and examine the role that all of us who are leaders in our different spheres can play in providing adaptive and responsive leadership to address the challenge. Most, if not all, of Africa's major security challenges predate COVID-19, and there's no evidence to suggest that the pandemic has caused any major violent conflict anywhere on the continent. However, emergence of COVID-19 and its social economic implications have exacerbated social tension and are great causes of concern for Africa's fragile states and conflict affected societies. The pandemic has reinforced the factors that make insecurity thrive on the continent. Let us examine a few of such factors that have, uh, that have security implication across the continent. Let me start with recession. While Africa has not recorded high rate of COVID-19 related deaths as anticipated by some, the economies of African countries have been badly hit by COVID-19. The pandemic has slowed down, stagnated, or in some cases, even reversed growth. From all available estimates, Africa suffered its worst recession in more than 50 years in 2020 due to COVID-19 pandemic as its GDP declined by 2.1%. The recession has great impact on livelihoods across the continent as jobs were lost and inflation hit the roof. Physical deficit. According to the African Development Bank, physical deficit in Africa are estimated to have doubled in 2020 to a historical high of 8.4% of GDP. Debt burdens are likely to rise by 10 to 15% in the short term to medium term. Exchange rate fluctuations have been elevated and inflation has inched up with external financial inflows heavily disrupted, almost non-existent. All of these mean that there's less money available to African governments to fund their programs. In some countries, it is already difficult even to pay workers' settlements. Some countries are now borrowing to fund their recurrent expenditure. What is worse is that the pandemic has created the need for more government spending in health and social safety programs in order to cushion its effect on citizens. Indeed, huge stimulus packages 
have been made available by governments at great cost and often from debt. While governments are struggling to make life easier for citizens, non-state actors who promote insecurity have also been busy. There's evidence to suggest that at the peak of the pandemic, some terrorist organizations were supplying COVID-19 relief packages to people in areas where they had influence or control. An example of this is the Boko Haram in Nigeria. They were actively involved in providing relief packages in cash and in kind to people in the northeast part of Nigeria in an attempt to win the hearts of those who benefited from their largesse. These terrorists seek to fill the vacuum left by national government, providing safety nets for citizens who will otherwise be left to fend for themselves. This has serious security implications. Increasing poverty and inequality. COVID-19 has reversed the gains made with poverty reduction programs on the continent. Estimates show that up to 38.7 million more Africans who slide into extreme poverty in 2020 to 2021, due to the pandemic, pushing up the total of poor people in Africa to 465.3 million, or 34% of the African population in 2021. The estimated cost of bringing their income up to at least the poverty line is about $7.8 billion in 2020 and $4.5 billion in 2021. Inequality is likely to increase and school closures who have long lasting consequences on human capital and accumulation and productivity growth. Let me now go to food insecurity. The lockdowns adopted by many countries might have been necessary in reducing the spread of COVID-19, but they had great impact on food production and continue to do so. For us in Africa, the men farmers could not get to their farms, nor could they get the inputs necessary for food production. Globally, prices for key food commodities such as rice and wheat and maize have also skyrocketed and can impact African countries in the area of food insecurity. Several African countries are net importers for these products. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no debate that these are uncertain times compounded by the numerous challenges confronting African countries. The elephant in the room is how our leaders can respond to these challenges, especially in light of the potential security implications that they present. The COVID-19 pandemic has further exposed the dust of leadership in Africa, the deficit of leadership. There was no country in Africa that was prepared for this pandemic. If it had taken the dimension it has taken in other parts of the world, like Asia, 
Europe, and America. One will be forgiven to think that we all of Africa's experience, our leaders will have by now found ways to make our countries more resilient. That, of course, is not the case. We continue to struggle while rest, uh, while the rest of the world is learning from these challenges, adapting and moving ahead. Let me hope that the, these type of seminar will also help in making our leaders uh, chart course to move ahead. Let me share with you one or two personal experiences that show how leadership can make the difference in times of unprecedented, or unprecedented uh, challenges. And let me start with me coming out of prison and being elected to take over the affairs of running or to take over running the affairs of Nigeria in 1999. Before I was released from prison, the man who put me in prison, uh, General Abacha, of course, had planned to succeed himself. And any voice raised against him was muffled or silenced. And uh, when he died suddenly, and I came out, the feeling in Nigeria was that the country will not be able to survive the damage that Abacha had done to it. And when I was contesting the election, a number of people came to me and said, you will be the last president of Nigeria because after you, there will be no more Nigeria. That was how bad the situation was. And um, of course, I realized that the situation, the situation was bad. And we had the election, my party out of three political parties, won almost 63% of the votes. And uh, I became the president. I realized that all Democrats, all politicians have been in the wilderness for over 15 years that the military was in power. And it was necessary to have all hands on deck. So I told my party that I will want to have a national government. And my party said, no. The party has won with over 63% or almost 63% of the vote. So there is no need for a national government. I explained that this is uh, a difficult time, time of, uh, of uncertainty. Some people think that Nigeria may not survive the shock that it has gone into with Abacha. And then, of course, our constitution demands that there must be a minister from each state, and we had 36 states. 
And my party then said, well, you can have a national government, but all the party must have a minister from each of the states. So that means I will have to have 36 ministers for my party from for the 36 states. And then if I want to take minister from uh, for other two parties, uh, I will then have to take more than one minister from each state. That meant that I had 49 uh, ministers. And then um, that gave me a little bit of respite because the type of uh, agitation that I should be getting from the other political parties was uh, a little bit uh, subdued and it helped us to get the country stabilized and uh, to start moving the country forward. That was one. The second one that I want to give was the problem that even at that time I had with militancy in the Niger Delta. The Niger Delta youth were really, really agitated. And um, what could we do? I sent people to meet them in their different uh, areas in the creek. And um, they were not appeased. So I decided to meet them. I invited them and about 40 of them came. I gave them amnesty for that purpose and they came. Whatever they have done, they will not be arrested. They will be free to meet me, discuss and go back. And they took advantage. And I started asking them, why? What was your problem? And one of them got up and said, sir, when you were military head of state, you introduced universal primary education, free universal primary education. And that was why I was able to go to school. Otherwise, I will not have been able to go to school. I did well in primary school, and I went to secondary school. Then I did well in secondary school, and I passed and secured admission to go to university. And I said to myself, since I came from oil producing areas, I will study chemical engineering. And three years I've uh, graduated from the university. Three years I've not got a job. What do you expect me to do? And you are now talking of militancy. What do you expect me to do? I shook my head and I said, I understand. And from there, we started a program of dealing with them, providing empowerment, providing doing employment within the private sector in their, uh, in, within the Delta um, uh, region of our country, within the, uh, uh, and, and special equipment for them into the, uh, armed forces in the paramilitary and special recruitment into other parts. And that subdued uh, the agitation to a large extent. Well, I can give other uh, examples, but uh, I will not bore you with uh, those. Maybe uh, on this note, I should yield the floor the moderator 
for the interactive session to begin. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Excellency, for these inspirational and forthright uh, remarks on uh, both the challenges that uh, COVID-19 uh, presents and uh, uh, compounds uh, for you know, not just uh, 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 the African continent, but of course, uh, people everywhere, uh, but especially uh, uh, in Africa, uh, uh, we, we are deeply concerned and uh, 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 um, uh, compelled uh, by the magnitude of uh, uh, the needs uh, that uh, can be exacerbated as uh, societies uh, struggle with this very deadly disease. Uh, and it requires leaders, as you said, uh, at all levels uh, uh, to uh, uh, be able to respond and to adapt uh, even when there are things that uh, we can't uh, foresee. Now that we have some experience around the world and we can uh, foresee some of the challenges, uh, and I commend to, to colleagues, uh, uh, there is a, 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 a post on our website, uh, on the africacenter.org website about the lessons uh, from India for Africa, because we can learn uh, from those lessons if we have leaders who are adaptive uh, and strategic uh, in uh, thinking about uh, how to get ahead of this this uh, very grave uh, challenge. Uh, but then you've you've highlighted some other uh, examples as well uh, from your experience, which is exactly what we were hoping for uh, to, to hear from you. And so on that note, I'd like to turn over to Michelle uh, to you know, take our conversation further uh, and uh, help us unpack uh, some of um, President Abbas and Joe's experience uh, uh, and what it means uh, to uh, to anticipate, uh, to identify, as he talked about with the Niger Delta uh, youth, you know, the underlying issues and really get at, you know, the, uh, the, the underlying uh, uh, challenge uh, or, or problem to be solved, you know, to adapt you know, then you know, responses and uh, to be accountable. Uh, I also heard uh, President Abbas and Joe uh, take responsibility you know, to, to get to, to the root of, of the issue. So, so Michelle, over, over to you to, to help us take our conversation further. Thank you, Kate. Um, good afternoon um, to all the, uh, the Africa Center alumni community, to President Abbas and Joe. Um, it's always a pleasure uh, sir, to engage with you on a conversation on leadership. Um, as you are known, um, as um, someone um, who has strong views um, about leadership of service. And the two examples that you just provided are significant to um, actually the type of leadership you demonstrated at national level. Uh, perhaps I would like to come back to the two um, examples that you gave. The first one, which is the power sharing um, deal that you mentioned that actually kept the country together at a time of critical challenges, uh, but also time of uncertainty for, for Nigerians at that time. The second one um, on the Niger Delta insurgency, which actually you managed to, to bring a solution about. And I think those are two key examples at national level that give us hope. So if we have to come back and you have to give a message to um, the alumni community that listen to us today, who are leaders um, on their own way, as you mentioned, um, at different levels, would you, what strategies have worked for you that you can share with them? And how would you define that adaptive leadership when you are taking those decisions and how you come about the, those, those, the, those decisions at, at that time. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy that you saw the significance of the two, uh, the significance of the two uh, examples that I gave. Um, and even with that, with, with those two examples, you could see one of the things that I see as a major problem in Africa, which is diversity. And the, the problem of most African countries is leadership not appreciating that 
diversity is natural, is God-given, but the management of it is their responsibility as leaders. And the mismanagement of leadership, and of uh, diversity rather, is to me, or to my mind, one of the greatest shortcomings of leadership in Africa, particularly at the political level. And there's no African country that hasn't got uh, within it this diversity we are, I'm talking about, whether it's diversity of language, of uh, culture, of tribe, of uh, uh, religion, uh, <coughs> it's there. And um, it needs to be managed. Uh, and once, whether in reality or is uh, perceived, not real, once people start feeling left out or feeling unattended, uh, or feeling marginalized, then problems start to arise. And um, when I, I, I became elected president, I wanted all politicians, all political parties to feel that, well, look, this new era of democracy, we are all in it together. And it worked. And of course, after my second term, uh, uh, or after my first term, rather, in the second term, I did not bring them in. I said, well, now democracy has been established. Uh, <laughs> let, 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 uh, let's play it uh, that way. But, uh, uh, Michelle, the, the problem I see, and you go in, to see the problem in our, the, the situation in any of our countries, what you see is this, what I call mismanagement or uh, um, non-management at all of diversity. And uh, whether it's diversity in uh, tribe, in language, in culture, in uh, everybody. You, you must try and bring everybody to feel that they are partakers, they are stock, uh, stakeholders. In, mm -hmm. um, uh, that, 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 that is uh, really my profession and that's my uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. You mentioned management of diversity as perhaps one key um, lesson that uh, we need to continue to nurture and discuss because that's perhaps the leaders who are listening to you today will have to take on board um, in their next session but there is let's let's still st um, start um, continue to to focus on on the national level um, there is one particular example that is very dear to my heart and i know uh, we had a couple of discussion around it it's the bakasi issue um, at that time, it was also a time of uncertainty for Nigeria. Could you perhaps share with us um, how you come about the, the decision when you knew at that time that that decision could have actually turned the country, uh, torn, torn the country, country apart? Perhaps um, it would be worthwhile sharing with us um, at national level also how um, that episode on, in the history of Nigeria um, has also given you um, the name of uh, the great leader that we know um, in Africa today. Michelle, thank you very much. Uh, Bakasi was uh, uh, a, 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 a difficult uh, one. Um, <clears throat> by the time I came out of prison and by the time I was elected the president of Nigeria, Bakatsi had uh, been boiling between Nigeria and Cameroon. And um, 
Cameroon had taken Bakasi issue to the uh, International Court of Justice at The Hague. And Nigeria had gone there to defend uh, its action. Uh, after my election, before my swearing in, I made the inquiry. Where are we on Bakasi? And my inquiries indicated that we are not on strong wicket. <clears throat> but the lawyers were telling the politicians that, oh no, there's a, a law that can make the uh, International Court of Justice to proclaim that or declare Bakasi as belonging to Nigeria. And uh, late uh, Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations, saw the problem and he invited me and President Kolbia to talk to us. Of course, the case was in court uh, and both sides believe they will win, but he wanted to douse the, uh, uh, the what may be the outcome, no matter uh, what, what may be the reaction, rather, no matter the outcome. So <clears throat> he wanted us to agree and well, we agreed that whatever may be the outcome we will accept then <clears throat> we again made effort before the pronouncement of the court at the Hague anyway the declaration of the court was that Bakasi belonged to Cameroon. We were occupying about two thirds of Bakasi militarily. And some Nigerians said, look, we should remain where we are, take two thirds of Bakasi and hold it. Um, I personally didn't feel that that was right. One, we should not have, in the first instance, we should not have allowed uh, Cameroon to go to the Hague. We should have resolved it politically. And that was what we did with uh, Sartome and Principe and Nigeria, we did not allow, and I handled that, uh, we resolved the issue politically and uh, on a uh, friendly basis. Now, with the I see the president, we can't hear you, your internet. Uh, declaring Bakasi as, oh, okay. Uh, are, you, are you hearing me now? Yes, it's better. Oh. Yeah, I think with the uh, ICJ declaring uh, Bakasi as belonging to Cameroon, then I went to uh, President Paul Bia. And I said to him, look, you have won a legal case. Legally, you have won. Let me and you work so that you can win politically. 
And he said, what do I mean by that? I said, look, those Nigerians who are in Bakasi believe that they are Nigerians. They are not Cameroonians. So if I just leave them there, you will have problem. Let me go to them and prepare them. Give me two years from the date that the uh, declaration of Bakasi becoming uh, part of Cameroon, give me two years to prepare the ground. And he was, he thought I was playing games. I said, no. So I went and I said to the Nigerian there that look, the international court had declared that Cameroon, uh, that Bakasi belonged to Cameroon. You, if you want to move out of Cameroon, where which Bakasi is part of, we will make room for you in Nigeria. But if you choose to remain in Bakasi, you then become a Nigerian living in Cameroon. And there are already 2 million Nigerians who are in Cameroon. You are about 150,000. You will be added to those 2 million. Those of you who do not want to live in Cameroon, we will provide. And then we, in the meantime, we were working with Cameroon, what we will do, what they will do, what they will take over, and all that. And um, that's what we did. Uh, eventually, we met uh, in the US and the uh, Peach Tree uh, uh, Agreement, and uh, we uh, finally handed over uh, again. Uh, Kofi Annan was there uh, to chair that meeting. Um, but once an international court in which we subscribe to and Cameroon subscribe to made a pronouncement, I believe that we should obey it because we went to defend uh, our own uh, position in that court and we lost. And then we should behave as uh, 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 as somebody who believes, as a nation who believes in uh, uh, rule of law, both at home and internationally. And that's what we did. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Indeed, a great, a great lesson of, uh, of leadership and adaptive leadership. Let me, let me quickly uh, move to the continental level. Um, you're also known as uh, someone who um, fought for the African Union to be the institution it is today. Um, and you mentioned um, during your introduction critical mass. Uh, leadership is about having a critical mass. Um, during the time uh, when um, you undertook the changes with many other leaders of the African Union, did you really had that? Um, did you have have that that critical mass? Uh, were you supported enough to be able to take those those decisions, and were you supportive uh, supported by those leaders and young younger leaders um, at that time, or? you believe uh, that few of you could have just uh, moved ahead and took the decision and be followed by the others. I think this is also um, worth um, sharing with, uh, with the alumni today. Um, what happened was, and uh, don't forget, I talk of critical mass, I did not talk of majority. <laughs> um, and what happened was, leaders have certain amount of influence in certain amount of uh, at a particular time in some particular area 
So what did what happened was that to some extent Nigeria had uh, 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 let me put it this way Nigeria has some influence in West Africa as at that time. South Africa has some influence in Southern Africa. As at that time. And then we had Algeria with the Botuflika not as much as we will say Nigeria has in West Africa and uh, South Africa in uh, East Africa, but uh, it has a bit of goodwill. So what did we then do? The three of us, Nigeria, South Africa, um, um, Algeria, we decided that for us to be able to have the critical mass in North Africa, Egypt should be with us. So we reach out to President Mubarak in Egypt. In West Africa, we decided that yes, Okay, Nigeria has a bit of influence, but we must not lose sight of Anglophone, Francophone. So we reach out to your country, Senegal. Um, and then in East Africa, we reach out to Tanzania and Kenya. So we now had what I would call critical mass. South Africa, Nigeria, Senegal, uh, Algeria, uh, uh, Egypt, and uh, Tanzania and Kenya, uh, as I said. So we could move if there's anything that we have to decide. South Africa, we reach out to Botswana, Mozambique, Namibia. Um, in West Africa, um, Nigeria and uh, Senegal, we reach out to uh, almost all uh, West African countries. Um, in North Africa or Maghreb, uh, uh, we will leave it to uh, Egypt and Algeria, um, and and that is how we build the uh, critical mass to be able to do a lot of what we did. Um, and um, I, we 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 had on written law among ourselves, if Nigeria wants something in the international arena, um, there's no reason why uh, South Africa or Algeria or Egypt should compete with it. And if, for instance, the time that South Africa bid for uh, world uh, um, uh, what, 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 what do you call it? World, world March. Uh, world Cup. World, uh, world Cup. Mm -hmm. World Cup. <laughs> now, my own Minister of uh, uh, Sports went to that same meeting and said, oh, Nigeria is interested. Nobody asked him to. 
told him Nigeria is interested. Well, um, South Africa was interested. South Africa made a bid. And so um, I then said, no, Nigeria is not interested. I even apologized to uh, President uh, Sabumbeki. I said, no, my Minister of uh, Sport was not sent uh, such a message. Um, you want it, we back you up, you have it. Um, Thank you. Where we, we, we went, and it worked. it worked. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, I Perhaps um, uh, we are running a little bit um, behind schedule. Um, perhaps with this very good example um, that actually showed a critical mass in the leadership, um, uh, in, in adaptive leadership, um, could we today um, look at, at that time, it was mainly about uh, economic transformation in Africa. Can we look at that critical mass today in the security sector and actually use uh, what you had at that time as strategies and techniques to work together and demonstrate leadership when it matters, um, it mattered. Is it possible to use the same principle today to actually um, put a put a term um, in all these um, challenges, security challenges that Africa has today? Yeah, Michelle. Yes. Well, um, nothing really uh, has changed except the personalities. Um, there's still no reason today while South Africa and Nigeria and uh, Senegal and Algeria and Egypt and uh, well now Morocco is uh, back, um, Morocco and uh, Kenya and, uh, cannot uh, work together. And look at, you see this, this, this type of thing we did that time. It's, um, we, we, we look at, of course, uh, across we, we look at our own country, but we do not we do not work in silos. Uh, anything that has to be done, we look at the need of other countries. For instance, I said to um, uh, South Africa, you need oil. Our government to government have. 100,000 barrels of oil a day. So, so on government to government. Now, there's no reason why we, we cannot do that today because we, we, we produce oil. We, instead of saying, look, go and uh, I don't know what they, they need, and uh, that helped. Um, uh, today, we have. Uh, COVID-19, now which are the countries that can produce the uh, uh, vaccination? Why can't we make those countries produce vaccination for the rest of us? Why not? I believe that those, uh, well, what we did in those days uh, can still be done today in security. For instance, we, 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 we had Boko Haram, and there's, it took time before the countries, which they now call Lake Chad Basin, Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, Niger, uh, and I believe that that could be widened to even include Burkina Faso and uh, all, all, all that. Now, because if you are dealing with terror, terrorists and you are only going within your own boundary, the, and the, these are terrorists that know no border, then how do you deal with them? The heat in Nigeria, they go to Cameroon. The heat in Cameroon, they run to uh, Niger. Now, you have to. And there's no reason why you should not have that uh, common working together. For instance, 
when the uh, when Sudan had the problem in Darfur, Nigeria went in, and we went in with Rwanda, and we were there before the uh, UN, in fact, started coming in, and um, and then we, we 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 got something that was unique, which was. UN backing the uh, uh, AU uh, force rather than a UN force. It was AU force backed by UN. Mm -hmm. Now, again, uh, we did that. Then we did it uh, in Liberia, in Sierra Leone. Uh, I, I, I believe that. Uh, we, 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 whatever area of security we are talking about. Uh, when, when I visited uh, the three countries that was uh, affected by Ebola, and the story I had was uh, then Corona said, uh, Corona said, look, we wake up in Freetown and they will say 150 people died overnight. Now, what happened? How did it happen? And uh, when uh, uh, Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, and uh, Guinea uh, Conakry started exchanging information, they started working together. They started manning their borders and all that. And they started dealing with the issue. Now, Uncertain time, difficult time, what does the leadership do? Both in their own country, with their neighbors, and in the continent. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, I would like to hand over to Kate. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but Mr. President, if you had to summarize um, what you just said and the key example that you share with us in three words what would you leave as a lesson in just three words as a lesson to um our our participant today three words would be walk let africa work together oh that's what was africa must work together that's also for work. africa to work together <laughs> thank you thank you mr president that was great that was a great conversation as usual it's always a pleasure uh, talking to you about leadership i know how passionate you about you are about it as i am uh, let me now hand over uh to to kate um for the q a Kate, over to you. Thank you, Excellency, and thank you, Michelle. Uh, we're so delighted uh, to to benefit uh, from from the conversation and uh, uh, this uh, very long uh, uh, history that uh, I know you have working together. Um, we do have many colleagues who uh, are eager to ask a, a few questions, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. President, I heard you say across your examples that um, leadership is intentional. You know, we have to build and cultivate leadership you know, at all levels. Uh, and uh, that includes uh, uh, identifying and um, uh, reinforcing shared interests, you know, whether it's at the continental level, as you've just explained, or at the national level, as you talked about uh, with some of your examples uh, in, in Nigeria. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's a really important lesson. I hope that uh, we'll all take with us uh, and uh, that we, we want to continue to encourage everyone uh, uh, to explore how do we cultivate uh, uh, these qualities of uh, being an adaptive leader uh, and uh, preparing ourselves uh, for the moments that uh, we can't always know the exact uh, challenges that will come, but we know there will be challenges. So um, at this time, we're going to uh, invite uh, colleagues, uh, uh, in addition to the questions coming in on the chat line, if you would like to use the raise hand function in your Zoom menu, uh, you may raise your hand uh, and uh, I will try and uh, call on uh, uh, several colleagues. We'll enable your microphone uh, to be able to speak your question uh, if you wish to do that. 
Uh, and then I will also uh, bring in some of the questions uh, that are coming in uh, through the chat line. Uh, so let's um, let's uh, start uh, with uh, Kaba, uh, as I can see it uh, in our participant list. Uh, please introduce yourself uh, for President Abbasanjo and ask your question. Uh, je suis, je suis Mamadou Kaba. I am Mamadou Kaba. I'm a former president of the Independent International Institution for Human Rights in Guinea. I am currently the president of the League for Human Rights and Democracy in Africa. Prior to asking my main question, I would like to ask Mr. President, when, when you look back, what are your regrets? What do you regret not having done? And based on the objectives, so that the objectives that, that would be worked on now would be different. So now the main question is about Guinea. <clears throat> you said Africa must work together, but currently Guinea, for security reasons, are, Guinea is closing its borders with some of its uh, neighboring countries. Mr. President, Nigeria has a lot of influence in the sub-region, and you have a lot of experience in terms of cooperation, international cooperation, especially inter-African cooperation. What have you done? What do you, what will you do to resolve this situation in the quickest manner? And I would like your opinion about the current situation in Mali. If you were consulted about this and given all your experience, uh, and, and we, we admire you a lot, so if you were consulted now, what would be your advice uh, regarding this situation, not only to the Malian military, but also um, to the authorities like ECOWAS? Thank you very much. Well, Kaba, you have uh, put in a number of questions. Um, if I may just um, deal with uh, Kaba now. Well, first of all, you said, well, um, what are my regrets? Well, a friend of mine long ago, I, my doctor in, in London, um, he, when he was celebrating his 65th birthday and I was, uh, I was around 40 something, and uh, I took him out. And while we were waiting to go into the restaurant to celebrate his birthday, I asked him the same question that you asked me, what are his regrets? And he looked after he thought for a while, he said, oh, look, um, you only regret what you should have done, which you failed to do, and which is too late to do. So I don't have any regret because I don't have anything which you have, I should have done which I have not done, and which is too late for me to do. So if that is what you will call regret, then I have no regret. Because there's no thing that I had opportunity to do that I did not uh, try to do. Now, whether I achieve success in all of them or I do not, that's a different thing. Um, but having opportunity to do something and trying to do it means that you don't regret for try, trying to do. You regret what you should have done, which you didn't do, and which is too late to do. Now, uh, then you talk about cooperation. I believe very much, and I, that's why I talk of working together. You see, Piecemeal, we are weak, but together we are very strong. And we have seen this in almost everything we have done in Africa. Um, the, the point is that we do not work together as we should work together. Now, you are taking the present situation in Mali. Um, 
where Mali thing was going on. I was following. And I was saying to myself that I hope that Mali will not degenerate into a military coup. Um, and you know, because of the way that uh, AU has handled uh, the situation of removing government or going into government, uh, not the democratic way, not the constitutional way, uh, people, uh, even when they have coup now, they say it's not coup. We had that in uh, Zimbabwe. Um, and, um, well, you, you remove, uh, the military remove a leader, an elected leader, uh, brought another leader, and then the military became number two, and um, say, well, look, the leader they have brought is not uh, a military uh, leader, is uh, the leader that should have been there. Um, a civilian. Um, I, I think maybe AU will have to redefine a coup. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. But the, the AU must be clear what it will accept and what it will not accept. And once, once AU uh, declares what it can accept and what it cannot accept, any country that goes against what AU cannot accept, then AU does not accept it. As yeah, simple as that, uh, the country can go whichever way it likes, but AU should not accept it. Um, and that would be my own uh, uh, advice. Uh, if you want to uh, seek advice. Now there, I, I, when I was uh, 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 the president of Nigeria, there was what the, the, the majors who carried it out called a coup in Satomi uh, uh, Principi. And the president was with me in Nigeria. We were holding a meeting where we were to hold a meeting. And then he, he, he called me and said, look, there's a coup in his country. I said, coup in your country? What has happened? So he said, well, he will not be able to attend the meeting that we, uh, he has come for because uh, they have de uh, deposed him. I said, you are not deposed. As far as I'm concerned, you are still the president of your country. Let's go to the meeting. And we went to the meeting. And then after the meeting, I said, look, I'm taking you back to your country. He said, how? I said, look, for you came here as president of Sartome Principi, and um, you are still president of Sartome Principi. I'm taking you back. So I, uh, we went in my, in, my, in my plane and we went to President Bongo. And I said to President Bongo, you are the doyen of uh, Central Africa um, region. Now tell those boys that I'm bringing their president back. He said, take him there. And that's why I, I took him there. And when we got there, I called the uh, boys. I said, look, what are your grievances? They say they have grievances. And uh, I said, well, if you have grievances, you don't, uh, you are not trained. I'm, I'm, I, I, I was once a soldier like you. Uh, I, 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 you are not trained to use the, um, uh, to take your gun against your, your own government. You are trained to use your gun against uh, enemies of your own country and your own government. Um, that, that, that would be my, 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 my the way I will look at it, uh, Kaba. I, 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 well, the AU has to make up its mind what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. But for now, I know that in the constituent, uh, constituent, uh, constituent, 
constitue constitue constitutive uh, constitutive uh, um, um, act of the AU uh, remove uh, bring coming to government by not by constitutional means means you are not admitted to AU. Well, uh, Mr. President, uh, that's an important uh, 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 precept uh, from uh, uh, the African Union's own founding documents and uh, one that I know that you are uh, uh, the most keen champion of across the, the continent and uh, 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 we need more of a critical mass uh, perhaps uh, to continue to join you uh, in uh, protecting and defending that. A uh, very uh, foundational principle for for democratic governance that uh, uh, is uh, representative and inclusive uh, of, of uh, all peoples. And we have some other questioners, uh, so let me invite um, Charles Mumuni uh, to uh, unmute himself uh, and please introduce for uh, President Obasanjo and ask your question briefly. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I'm Charles Mumoni, a professor at uh, Laval University in Quebec City in Canada. Um, I am one of uh, the alumni of your African Leadership Forum. I attended a one-week seminar okay. in 1992 in Ottawa, in Abiyo Kuta <laughs> State, and I know the, the impact that this experience has on my career. I am grateful to you for this wonderful opportunity. Um, you, you mentioned that leadership uh, should be measured at all level and in all walks of society, but we can't become leaders of, overnight. Uh, in many cases in Africa, Africa is governed by people who are not leaders, but just power holders. Um, how do we make sure that in Africa, all power holders are equipped to lead? In other words, uh, should leadership be taught as formal education or rather as a long life, uh, a lifelong uh, uh, learning. In each case, uh, what could be Africa's strategy for leadership education? Charles, I, I, I'm happy that you are a product of um, leadership forum and that what the exposure that that gave you uh, stood you or co and continues to stand you in good stead. Um, I, I believe that the totality of life, the totality of life from cradle to grave is a school. And a school in everything, including leadership. Um, there, well, there are going to be people you will interact with, the exposure you will have that will help you. Uh, There will be experiences that you will have that will help you. But particularly on the political level, it is very difficult in Africa. You, you see in other countries, take uh, the U U UK that I can talk a little bit about, before you become a political leader, there are processes that you will have gone through. You will either have gone to a public school, and then you will have, to, uh, or, uh, in addition, also gone to a particular uh, university or to some form of or some universities, um, some exposures that you will have had in one form or the other. 
And then when you become, uh, join a party, you start from the uh, local level, the council, uh, council level, and then you make your way out, uh, up until you get to the uh, House of Commons, and then you are a backbencher, then you become a frontbencher, and all that. Now, all that is process of exposure, training, and all that. In, the, um, in America, until very, very, very recently, when America is looking for political leadership, they go either into what I call the League of Governors or the Congress. Um, again, you will see the process that had taken you from becoming governor, uh, up to becoming governor, or uh, up to going into the Congress either as a, a member of uh, uh, Congress or a senator. Now, we, we don't have that. And I believe probably we should also institutionalize that type of thing in our own system in Africa, Charles. Uh, it is part of the problem we, we have here in Nigeria today. And we are saying, when people talk to me, I say, look, let us get our institution right first, because we are now, people are talking of restructuring here in Nigeria. What do they mean by restructuring? I believe they are talking of devolution of power, uh, responsibilities, and resources. Now, if we are able to resolve that and sort that out, we will also have to sort out what should be the process of bringing up leadership, particularly political. Military, it's clear. Now, you cannot be uh, uh, a, 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 an officer unless you go through a particular type of training. And after you have gone through that type of training, you have to also go through certain courses and pass certain exams. You have to do uh, a lieutenant to captain exam before you can become captain. Captain to major exam before you can become major. And you have to have gone to staff college before you can become lieutenant colonel. And then you have to have gone to um, either the war college or um, uh, something before you can become brigadier. Now, so the uh, uh, training. Now, I think in the private sector, they also have that sort of training. Some uh, organizations have that sort of training that takes you up. But um, in politics in Africa, um, you, you can just become anything without being anything. And that is not good enough. Mr. President, we uh, certainly need to do more to uh, deepen the institutions that can grow uh, and to develop leaders of all sorts. Um, you know, you've rightly pointed out uh, the military institutions uh, uh, when they're professionally run uh, and merit-based, uh, uh, they do a great job uh, to cultivate leaders. Uh, and we need this, uh, these uh, opportunities uh, to, to grow and develop uh, on our civilian side as well. Um, I would like to invite uh, Ambassador Cezabera uh, to unmute himself and uh, uh, ask his question uh, briefly, uh, and uh, please to introduce for the rest of the, the audience. Uh, uh, over to you, sir. Hello, uh, well, thank you very much. But actually, I have no question. I was just seated here listening to His Excellency uh, President Obasanjo. 
and taking in his words of wisdom. I really have no questions. I can, can only say I fully agree with what the president was, was saying. And I'm sure this is just the tip of the iceberg. He's just scratched the surface. If we had a bit more time, maybe he would uh, <laughs> share with us no more. We, we, yeah. we certainly could, could listen to, to uh, His Excellency all day long. We do have some other questions then from the chat line. Uh, uh, Mr. President, um, uh, there are too many for me to read them all, but uh, let me sum up a few of them that uh, would like to know your view on, um, uh, uh, on the state system uh, in Africa uh, is uh, one of the question. Uh, do you still believe that the present setup of Africa with her many weak states, do you believe it is still viable? And the, okay, the questioner okay. goes on to ask, is it not necessary for Africa to revisit the ideas of Nkrumah and Nyeri, uh, that is the unification of Africa as, our, as a solution to our various challenges? And perhaps I can add a, a sort of related question uh, from a colleague on South Sudan uh, uh, and uh, asking for your experience uh, as a leader who witnessed Nigeria's transformation over the years. How would you relate that uh, to the world's youngest nation uh, who is still in its early stages of nation building? Uh, and uh, I know you know uh, too well, uh, struggling uh, very much with uh, power sharing and inclusion and uh, diversity, as you mentioned earlier. And so we have these states like South Sudan, uh, we have the continent uh, as a whole uh, with a collection of um, uh, some might say micro states uh, or you know, weak states or states with another questioner has it accidental leaders uh, who maybe don't exhibit the adaptive and strategic qualities that you have done so well, sir. So your, your okay. thoughts, uh, uh, on, okay. on these questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let me go to Sevbera. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, I think uh, <clears throat> if we have time, uh, there's uh, always a lot to say uh, about uh, different situations and different parts of Africa. Um, viable and weak states. What makes a state weak? My dear brothers and sisters, this is a true story. In Guinea-Bissau, there was an election going on. I was the chair of AU. President John Kufour was the chair of ECOWAS. And before the election was um, concluded, one of the candidates had declared himself the winner. The military had come in. And <clears throat> I called President John Kufour I said, look, President, where are you? He said he was in Accra. I said, look, I'm coming to meet you in Accra. Meet me at the airport, and we are going to Guinea-Bissau. Uh, so what are we going to do? I said, we are going to stop the nonsense there. So <clears throat> we went, I went and I picked him at the airport. And we were going to Guinea, uh, Guinea Bissau. As we were about to land, my brother looked at the uh, looked from the window of the aircraft and said, look, there's no reason for this country to be poor. Look at water. Look at all the vegetative, uh, vegetation. This country should not be poor. And I turned to him, I said, look, 
Mr. President, tell me which country in Africa should be poor. And he said to me, hey, come to think about it. No country in Africa should be poor. The same, I will say, which country in Africa should be weak? And why are countries weak? And let's take example. Rwanda and Burundi were under the same colonial rule. Today, they are miles apart. Why is one better than the other? Simple. Leadership. Which is what we are talking about. And Guinea Bissau, I was telling you about, this is a country. Whatever you put, whatever tropical fruit or crop you put on the ground will thrive and thrive well, will grow well. When we go to the hotel, what they were serving us is imported apple, not banana, not mango, not papo, not pineapple, imported apple. And you talk of weakness or poverty. You can see. Banana will grow like anything. Mango will grow like anything. Orange will grow like anything. So, I have always maintained that the situation we are in, in our different countries in Africa, is not our choice. And it's not God's uh, lot for us. It's the choice of our leaders, consciously or unconsciously. And, that's, and our leaders are to blame. Let, let me give you one example here in Nigeria. When I came, when I became elected president, I did not know that when the Coco Alliance, uh, World Alliance broke down or was well, well, wound, wound up, Nigeria got $15 million. I didn't know. The officials were using that money because they don't have to budget for it. They were using it to travel all over the world. Before I knew what it was, they have spent two and a half million dollars of it. And when I knew, I stopped it. I said, we will use the money to improve cocoa production. In 2003, our cocoa production in Nigeria was 150,000 metric tons. Then I set up a committee to, uh, to uh, uh, improve cocoa production by 2000, with 12 and a half million dollars. By 2007, our cocoa production has gone up to 400,000 metric tons. I remember President John Kufo coming to me and saying, look, you are not producing country. Stop producing cocoa. I said, my brother, no. I'm, in fact, my objective is to produce 1 million metric tons of cocoa. He said, then you will kill my, uh, Ghana. I said, no. We will not kill Ghana. We will make sure that the price of cocoa is fixed from 
Ghana or from Nigeria. The truth is that Nigeria has not gone beyond that 400,000 metric tons, where it was in 2007. So if you then say Nigeria is poor, what, who makes Nigeria poor? If you say Nigeria is weak, who makes Nigeria weak? Our leaders, poverty, weakness, whatever you want to. So, and I believe that that is what um, Kate and the Africa Center for Strategic Studies is trying to do. Why should things be what they are? And why shouldn't they be otherwise? What can we do to make them be otherwise? Let me end. I don't know whether Kate still has more questions, but let me end on this note. And um, somebody has talked about uh, Africa Leadership Forum, which I established. And um, uh, I think it's Charles Mumuni who talked about that, or somebody. Yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to take people from West Africa, uh, from Africa, young up and coming leaders, to my friend uh, Lin Kuan Yu. I didn't want to take him, I want Lin Kuan Yu to come and uh, address uh, young. African leaders at the Africa Leadership Forum. And when I called him, Lee said, look, my friend, once I go against time, I'm no use for the next 40 hours. Why don't you bring these African young leaders to Singapore? I said, Lee, I haven't got the money. I have about 40 people I want to bring. He said, we will pay. And they threw, I think, one of their institutes. They invited us, and we went. For two days, Lin Kuan Yu was with us. He hadn't written his book from third world to first world by then. And all my young African brothers and sisters listened for two days, and Lin Kuan Yu was with us. And they were anxious to get the magic, so to say. And at the end, one of them asked the question, what is the magic? How have you done this? What did, did, did he do? He just brought people who work with him in one section in this, and they talked to us. And he said, there's no magic. We did a few things right and we continue to do them right. No magic. We did a few things right, and we continue to do them right. And I said to my brothers and sisters, that is it. That's the takeaway. Find out what your country is doing right, and keep doing them right. And find out if your country is not doing anything right, let your country start doing some things right and keep doing them right, widening and deepening. And that's it. We, we, I know I, I've exhausted the time that I requested of you, but I see that um, uh, we have Ambassador Fatima Mohammed uh, with us, and I believe she wants to, to, to uh, maybe have the final word. Uh, so uh, Ambassador Mohammed will invite you to unmute yourself. Uh, if you're still there, and uh, we're just so delighted to, that you're you're joining us as well. Please over to you. Um, good morning, Kate. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. 
good morning. Morning, Kate, Michelle, Luca. Nice to see you all. Uh, Babana, good morning. Uh, very nice to see you, my president. And um, uh, thank you uh, for organizing this, but most especially for the opportunity um, to hear um, such deep insights uh, from um, President Obasanjo, who's not only you know a leader for us uh, in Nigeria and West Africa, but but, but continentally and even globally. Um, and um, I think there are a number of things, I'll try to be brief, um, that he's touched upon that I would, I think would be an entire conversation, but I, I, I would just like to um, ask a, one very direct question in terms of uh, many of the things you touched about, touched upon, which happen to be, I think, projecting, you know, the challenges that we, we currently have, um, both nationally and continentally. Um, but concretely speaking, how can we in today's Africa, today's West Africa, today's Nigeria, look at uh, some of the gaps, uh, the challenges learning from the past and ensure that we start um, to, to correct them? Uh, you've talked about a critical mass of uh, leadership at one point uh, on the continent, for example. That group of leaders that are now our elders, how do we ensure that they're actually leading from behind? How do we ensure that we're actually building the kind of leaders um, that we need from the bottom up? And many a times when we talk about leadership, we think of it as a top-down thing, um, but the reality of it is uh, we have a lot of potential, particularly on the grassroots level, that's just not being explored. So my question is, how do we ensure today that we start bridging those gaps and making the changes that we need in order to address those challenges? Thank you. I don't know. You see, you see it, it, it's the same thing we, 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 we are going through. <clears throat> I've given you a number of things that we did. I had a problem in Guinea Conakry, uh, in Guinea Bissau. I decided, look, let me take a brother and a colleague and another president who has responsibility. We two of us went. And we went there and we said to the military boys who are, uh, they are, are, are and we, we, they all call themselves generals. And I told them, you have more generals in your army than Nigerian army. Um, just because you fought uh, a guerrilla war for independence. Now, I, I think we have to have proactive leadership. Now, so we then, uh, the two of us resolved the matter. We didn't even spend the night and we came back. I told you the story of uh, Sartomi uh, Principi. I went to President Bungo. Now, we have this problem in our hand. How do we handle it? We agreed, we handled it, we came back. Part of our problem is that our leaders don't move together enough. And you can't do anything on your own. You can't do anything on your own. Nigeria, big as we are, with one uh, with a population of two hundred million uh, people, we need to carry others along with us. And if we don't, then we don't make it. We do, we, we we have to carry others, and others, in fact, will some of them will willingly come along with us. But we have to make them want to come along. Uh, 
I believe that the situation that we had in the late uh, uh, in the beginning of this of, of, of this century in 20 and 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, and all that. Nothing has changed much other than the uh, dra dramatic personnel have changed. And if we play the game the way it was played then, I believe we will achieve more, more or less the same result. We will achieve more or less the same result. I, I don't look somebody you you do, you, you imagine you you go to a, a, a president and you are on, on first name basis or you there's something and you go and say look this what do we do about this I I don't see any other thing I don't know I, I don't see any other thing uh, any other way? I don't see any other way. I, I, I don't. I, 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 we, we make it uh, look difficult. It, it's not difficult. I, 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 I don't. If uh, a president will go to another president and say, hey, look, this problem, how do we solve it? They put their heads together, and if there is a third party that a third president that they should call to get it resolved, they will resolve it. But um, one, we act in silos. Two, we don't talk to ourselves enough. We don't carry ourselves al uh, along enough. Um, I, I believe we need to do a lot more, a lot, a lot better than we are doing. That, that's all. Even in, inside our own countries, um, Fatima had that question. Even inside our own countries. Now, look, the other day I was talking to uh, uh, Fatima. You are still there. She, she's not uh, unmuted, but she is still there, sir. Okay. She's hearing you. Now, what then happened was that here I, I, I asked here in Nigeria, I said, look, even let us leave whatever the politicians are doing. What stops the appeal for nature and from visiting? Nothing. But today, no. And you imagine how much better it will be for the two communities and the impression it will give us in Nigeria if we see this type of thing. How, how much better it will be? So I, I, I think uh, uh, we, we just need to, to wake up our ideas, as they say in the military. Let us wake up our ideas and do what is right. Mr. But President there's, said. There's no other way other than to be active and proactive. Exactly so, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you so much for spending all of this time with us and for your words of wisdom and insight uh, and inspiration. And even while we're challenged uh, at some levels uh, and in some ways uh, uh, wishing for more leaders uh, such as yourselves, uh, we know that uh, we have the power uh, to, to change uh, uh, the current uh, realities, to cultivate the common interests and the shared purpose, uh, the commitment uh, to core values, uh, that uh, we know will help make all of our societies uh, flourish uh, and uh, really uh, enable citizens uh, to live safely uh, and securely and freely 
uh, and uh, uh, we hope uh, in prosperity uh, across the board. And so uh, we thank you for the inspiration uh, that you are uh, and for your leadership uh, continued uh, on the continent uh, and around the world, uh, in fact, uh, and for spending this time uh, today with us. Uh, so on behalf of, of Dr. Luca and myself and our entire Africa Center uh, community, uh, thank you to Michelle uh, for helping us with this conversation and joining in. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for uh, a most wonderful discussion. Uh, we have so many more comments and uh, questions on the chat line. I apologize that we could not get to them all, uh, but uh, uh, please know that you are treasured uh, and uh, valued uh, and uh, appreciated uh, for uh, not just being with us today for everything that you have done and uh, uh, continue to do. Yeah, so we thank you most uh, sincerely from the bottom of our hearts uh, uh, for spending this time with us today. Hey, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, Luca, thank you very much. And uh, Michelle, thank you all of you who have uh, um, ask questions. I thank you all. Um, if there are things that uh, I've left out, um, count that against me. Uh, <laughs> but there will be another time uh, in future. Um, but uh, let me just uh, uh, say this. I am very hopeful about Africa. We are not deficient of human capacity that can lead Africa well. We are not there yet, but I believe we will be there. And my prayer is that we may get there in my lifetime. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, sir. We are gonna work our hardest, all of us, uh, to make sure that we uh, fill the leadership uh, needs of the continent. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you.